Welcome back to another video guys. In this one, I'm gonna have a chat about Cape York and in particular, the old Telegraph track. So we went and did the old Tally track in Cape York for the first time. So I thought I'd put together a, a video and kind of uh, run through our experience um, up at the Cape and in particular the OTT. And I thought I might be able to pass on a few hints and tips if you're planning a trip up to Cape York yourself and you wanna do the Overland Telegraph track. At the end of the video guys, I'm gonna run through all the creek crossings, what to expect when you're doing the OTT. And if you're planning a trip up to the Cape, um, you won't want to miss it. I'm going to go and explain them all and let you know just how bloody friggin' awesome it is. Anyway, let's get straight into the video. First up, what is the OTT? So um, obviously the OTT is the Overland Telegraph track. And uh, I'm not going to give a full history of the track itself, but effectively or essentially uh, it follows the line of the old telegraph line but um, but the track itself is about 100 kilometers in length and uh, it's split into two sections so you've got the southern section which starts at Bramwell Junction and then you'll make your way up through numerous creek crossings you'll then intercept the bypass road or the Bamaga road and then you start the northern section of the OTT and then you've got further creek crossings and waterfalls and those sorts of things so overall it's only about 100 k's so why is the OTT so iconic here in Australia? And I think it comes down to a couple of things. You've got some very unique history of the track itself. Secondly, you've got the, the remote environment in which you're traveling. It's quite um, spectacular scenery and you are up the top end of Australia. It's quite isolated and that also adds to the romance of it as well. Couple it up with all the creek crossings, the beautiful waterfalls, just the rugged nature of the landscape there. It is fair and bloody awesome. Then you've got the challenging nature of the track itself. It's not a maintained track so it is uh, that that challenge of doing the OTT and, and having to maybe repair your car halfway or get some help from, from some other people. So I think all those things wound up and also doing the track, there is a real, there's a real vibe if I can use that word guys. It's just the vibe of it. There's a real um, uh, positive energy on the track. Everyone doing it is a long way from home and uh, it's usually a bucket list trip. So you add all these things up and it spits out the OTT. The best time to bloody go to Cape York and the OTT, as you would know, it's gonna be in the dry season. So dry season runs from May through to October. The wet season is from November through to April. When did we go? Well, we went on our trip uh, at the start of August. And uh, I think there are three good reasons why I felt that was a, a fantastic time to go. First of all, it was outside of school holidays. Now, I know there might be some of you guys out there that can't avoid not going during school holidays. But if you can, it's going to be worth it because as I've been told during school holidays, it can get quite busy. However, we were up there in the first week of August and it wasn't crowded. So that's a big, big plus right there. Uh, also going in August, being later in the year, the creek crossings will be somewhat lower than if you went say in May or June. And that could help you out if you're doing the old tally track for the first time. Um, having said that, due to a big wet season that we had had the previous season when we went, uh, the creek crossings were still pretty high. So I can only imagine how high they were earlier in the season in May or June. Um, and a third reason why I think August is a good month is the weather is still reasonably okay. So we were hitting temperatures around the 30 degrees. Obviously it's pretty humid up there, but um, I would think that uh, May would be pretty, pretty humid. And June, July, obviously weather wise, that's going to be your best window for weather, a little bit cooler. But yeah, August, as I said, it's not too hot and it's certainly probably better than going in September um, or October. All right, so road conditions, guys. You hear a lot of talk about uh, the infamous corrugations all the way to the tip, and it's not necessarily the case. Uh, what I will say is the PDR, which is the road that uh, takes you on your way up to the Cape, starts in Lakeland in the south, and the PDR goes all the way to Weeper. That section, and it's called the PDR, the, the, the Peninsula Development Road, it's in pretty good condition, and a lot of it is now bitumen. They're, they're creeping further and further, 
getting it fully sealed all the way to Weeper and it's only a matter of time and it will be fully sealed. Now I don't see that as such a bad thing, especially for locals to live in Weeper and in those surrounding areas. About three quarters of the way up the PDR, the Peninsula Development Road, or halfway three quarters up, you will then turn right and make your way up the dirt road towards the tip. This road's called the Telegraph Road. Now that's not to be confused with the old Telegraph track, but it does lead you up that way. Now that section of road, we found no real problems at all. Again, a little bit more corrugated than the PDR in those dirt sections, but by and large, no real major issues. When you get to Bramwell Junction Roadhouse, this is where you would start the Overland Telegraph track. However, if you weren't doing the technical uh, Overland Telegraph track, you would continue around the OTT, and this road is called the Bypass Road or the Bamiga Road, and it's this part of the, uh, uh, well, it's not the PDR, but a lot of people still just call it the PDR to simplify things, but it's called the Babiga Road or the Bypass Road. Some of this section is really corrugated and really bad, especially when you get up, you cut through that southern and northern section of the OTT and you're heading towards the Jardine River Ferry. There are some pretty bad, gnarly corrugated sections on that part of the road. So you got yourself to Bramwell Junction Roadhouse and you're all you're all bloody ready to go for the OTT. How long do you stay on the Overland Telegraph track? Well, I can let you know what we did and I can let you know what I wish we had done. So basically we started the Overland Telegraph track at around lunchtime at Bramwell Junction. Effectively, we did two nights on the track over the 100 kilometers on the OTT and we did it very comfortably, no problem whatsoever in that sort of 48 hour time frame. But what I will say, if we had our time over again, I certainly would do an extra night at a minimum. And uh, I'm passing that knowledge on to you guys. Doing the OTT, do three nights at a minimum, maybe even four, maybe even five. And the reason why I say that is, is that when you travel to these remote locations around the country, you travel vast distances to get there. It's iconic, it's remote, it's awesome. Don't rush it. Getting into camp at lunchtime or one o'clock, so just spending maybe four or five hours on the, on the track, is gonna be a much more enjoyable experience where you can rock up to camp, set your camp up, get yourself sorted. It's two o'clock in the afternoon. What the heck, crack a beer and enjoy the creek that you're camping on. And then that gives you the opportunity to go in for a swim, go and relax, talk to other campers, other travelers, or other four wheel drivers as they're coming through. Doing that, you can really soak up and enjoy that whole environment if you spend just a little bit more time. Just in general, doing the Cape itself, I know this video is more just particularly the OTT, but obviously you're coming, coming all the way, you are gonna uh, visit some other locations up on the Cape. I would recommend at least 12 days north of Cairns. Uh, that'll give you enough time to, to do those three nights uh, or four nights on the OTT and obviously get to the tip, um, uh, explore north of the Jardine River and then you might do something else in the uh, southern area of the Cape. So at a minimum 12 days, 14 days north of Cairns would be ideal. So what vehicle do you need and what modifications should you have? Well, basically, first up, obviously, you can go all the way to the tip of the uh, continent in two-wheel drive and take the bypass road all the way to the tip. So pretty much any car can get you the tip. Clearly, though, we're talking about the OTT here. You will need a, um, uh, a, a four-wheel drive that's in good working, good working order. If you've been watching the series or you've been following the channel, you know that I'm driving a 200 series Land Cruiser and I've got it decked out with all the fancy mod cons, uh, which makes it nice and easy, but you certainly do not need all these fancy mod cons to do the OTT. So I'm gonna run through what I think are four of the most important mods that you will need to do if you wanna do the OTT. Number one is a snorkel and that's a given. Clearly you're going through a lot of water crossings, some of which are nudging over the bonnet, and uh, you are gonna need to get your ear in, air intake as high as you can. So a snorkel is a, is, is a must in my opinion. So second mod I think that you'd need to have is a winch. Now, it's, look, you could do the, the OTT without a winch, but the chances that you may use it is probably 50-50. I don't like to rely on going on a trip 
and having to rely on someone else's equipment to get me out of mischief or get me out of strife. So I think a winch is a must. We used it on this trip just on the one occasion, but in my opinion, a winch is certainly a necessity. Third modification would be some recovery points. So if you did get stuck and someone was having to snatch you out, they can at least snatch you out from, if you're from behind. Um, if you've got a, a tow hitch, you're good to go there. Uh, and then obviously if you've got some rated recovery points at the front of the vehicle, that's gonna allow you to be um, pulled out uh, if, if need be. Bull bar, do you need a bull bar? I'd say no, you don't need a bull bar, but it's one of those things where um, it's gonna give your car a little bit of extra protection going down some of those drop-ins and, uh, and obviously heading up into those remote parts of the country, wildlife, kangaroos, uh, dingoes running across the road, and those sorts of things. So a bull bar, not a necessity, but certainly would help um, having that mod on your car. We finally is, uh, is diff breathers. So I had um, aftermarket diff breathers installed on the car. You're doing a lot of water crossings. As you know, diff breathers, and I'm not a bloody mechanic as I keep on saying, but diff breathers are quite low in your car. So the diff breather extensions will bring those up, up into the bonnet, and that's gonna help prevent water getting in your diffs and in all those areas where you don't want water. So but just to recap on those mods, snorkel, diff breathers, a winch and recovery points. In terms of recovery gear also, make sure you've got a full well stocked well stocked recovery kit and uh, a set of max tracks or treads or something like that won't go astray. So they're certainly gonna come in use from time to time um, in some of those muddy areas where you're coming out of some of those uh, water crossings. The maps for Cape York and the OTT, you cannot go past the Hemmer maps as far as I'm concerned. I've got about a million of them. And one thing you want to pick yourself up, I didn't bring it down with me to do this video today, but I'll just overlay some images of the maps. But you can get a, a book on Cape York and it's the, uh, the whole how-to guide of Cape York. Uh, and you can get them from all areas, whether it's the Simpson Desert or, you know, wherever, the Flinders Ranges, whatever. But in this book here, you can go through the book there and it gives you all the hints and tips, what to take, what not to take, uh, all the different tracks, gives you some um, ideas on what tracks to do, what to expect, and it's also got maps in that big book book as well so that is the number one bible i would think you want to take with you and also research before you go up to cape york and do the ott the other one of course is the large paper map again i don't have it here with me but i'll just overlay some footage um, of the large paper map as well so um and that's quite detailed you can open that up and it just makes it easier sometimes if you open it up and have a look uh, instead of looking at it in book format and with all our trips that we do, I've also got Hemmer Maps downloaded on my phone. So I think it's about $100 for the app, um, relatively inexpensive, works offline. It's pretty bloody accurate, the uh, online map. I just use the phone, I don't have an iPad, I don't have any other fancy device that I use it on. Literally have it on my phone. Hemmer Maps is my choice for maps. Paper, the book, and the online maps. Can't go wrong. Camping on the OTT, a lot of people um, have asked, do you need a permit to camp on the OTT? And you don't. So you can camp pretty much anywhere you like. Most people will camp either side of one of the, uh, the beautiful creeks. And we found when we were there in August, I mean, it was relatively quiet. There were only a few creeks that had, you know, a handful of people around, but by and large, a lot of them um, didn't have a lot of people, and this was in August, and I'm sure it changes when you're in school holidays. But there are lots of spots you can camp. Don't need to worry about it. The only thing that I would suggest when you're camping on the OTT is get your firewood before you get to camp, because a lot of people don't. A lot of people are looking for firewood in that sort of sh short vicinity of the camp, and it's, everyone's already got that firewood. The only places where you're gonna need to either book in advance, and you do have to pay, a place is like, I think it's like uh, Elliot Falls, the beautiful falls there on the northern section of the Telegraph Track. There is a designated camping ground that's ran by Queensland National Parks. You do need to book and pay for that. Apart from that, the other caravan parks uh, and locations north of the Jardine River and obviously in some other areas in the southern sections of the Cape, 
um, you will need to book if you're taking your caravan up or you want a specific time and it is busy school holidays, you will need to book and pay for those caravan parks and those, uh, those locations. But generally speaking on the OTT, no permits, just bloody roll out your canvas and happy days. <laughs> touch on very quickly when you do finish the OTT and you're going to head over the uh, the Jardine River you'll go across the uh, the famous Jardine River ferry it is $110 be sure you've got cash they are not accepting uh, well, when we were there they weren't accepting FPOS or anything like that the $110 is the uh, uh, cost for that ferry but just how that relates to camping, that also allows you bush camping north of the Jardine River in that northern section of Cape York. Fuel, water and food. What I will say is, don't need to worry about fuel. So plenty of places to fill up all the way up the PDR. There's plenty of roadhouses and north of the Jardine River, there's obviously um, several places you can get fu uh, fuel there as well. So you're not really having to go more than, oh, I don't know, a couple of hundred k's without seeing somewhere where you can get fuel. So that's not an issue. Water's not an issue either in terms of getting, you know, bottled water or fresh water or filling up somewhere along the way. There's plenty of water and plenty of fuel. What I will say though, guys, is food. Um, and this is, you know, it's probably common sense, but I thought I'd relay it anyway. Before you leave Cairns or Atherton or Marie Bar or wherever your last point there is, do, do the biggest shop you can and take as much food as you can. Food is limited in the stores that are north of Lakeland. Um, in Weeper, if you're going to the west there, there is a Woolworths in Weeper, but uh, we, look, we didn't head there. However, all other locations are going to uh, have limited supplies of fresh, fresh meat, fresh uh, vegetables and fruit and that sort of stuff. Uh, I think it's wise to take as much food as you can for the trip. And you're only gonna be up there for, you know, a dozen days. So I think you can pack quite easily for that before leaving Cairns. The common question that I was reading before we went to the Cape was, Yahoo's and idiots. You, you, you hear on YouTube and on TV, you get up to the Cape, there's Yahoo screaming around, there's rubbish left everywhere, and is it true? Well, I'm gonna say, no, it's not. We didn't encounter any areas that were trashed with rubbish, uh, and we were later in the season in August. Um, that's not to say that at camp, going off in the bush to do the business, yeah, you did come across toilet paper, which is, which is disappointing people not burying their waste properly enough. So there is a bit of toilet paper laying around, but by and large, before I went up and everything that I was reading and hearing, I'm expecting to go up there and to be full of uh, yahoos and idiots and bogans doing all the wrong thing. And it just wasn't the case. The old telegraph track was just full of genuine people of all ages, uh, from 18 through to probably bloody 80, all having a great time and enjoying this iconic track and being respectful. Do you have to worry about crocodiles? It's far north Queensland, surely you do. Well, I think the big, the big question is, it depends on where you are up on the Cape, it's a big area. I think it's almost the same size as Victoria, almost that whole peninsula. So it's a pretty big, broad area to talk about if you are gonna run into crocodiles um, up at Cape York. Um, in this video, I'm more talking about the OTT. And to answer your question, the answer is no. You're not gonna run into any crocodiles. Having said that, big disclaimer, you might, I don't know. But look, all the, all, all the, all the uh, creek crossings you do, it's fresh water and it's flowing downstream and you're a long way inland. And from what I've read and seen, it's very, very, very rare to see a crocodile in any of these fresh water creeks. I wouldn't be concerned about it. Everyone's swimming in these creeks. Everyone's walking through the creeks. And I, I don't know, let me know in the comments if you've heard of anyone seeing a crocodile in one of these freshwater creeks on the OTT. Other areas of Cape, Cape York, obviously, like any area of Northern Australia, be crocwise if you're near the coast and you're near uh, salt water rivers. Yeah, clearly there are crocs about.
So how do you go with phone reception and communications on the OTT? Well, you're not going to get pretty much any signal from um, um, on the OTT whatsoever. And in other areas on the Cape, it is also very patchy. So in my opinion, go and get yourself a satellite phone. If you can't afford to buy one, they are only about $900 these days. However, if you can't afford to buy one, you can rent them. And I think having a sat phone um, or a PLB at a minimum is an absolute must when traveling anywhere remote. And I do know this season just gone, there were multiple um, evacuations on the OTT. Clearly, they will call in by uh, a sat phone, PLB, or maybe a high frequency radio. So that's why we're talking about communications and safety. And it goes without saying on any of these trips, you really want to have a fully well-stocked first aid kit and I always also carry a snake bite kit as well. Um, yeah, so they're probably, they're three things that I'd recommend doing the OTT in Cape York. Sat phone, good first aid kit, and a, um, and a snake bite kit as well. Just a few other sundry items, uh, cash, card, F -post, all those sorts of things. Um, Whenever I do remote travel, I always take cash. I've always got, um, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars in cash because a lot of places do only take cash only. And sometimes where they do take FPOS facilities, a lot of the times the internet can be intermittent and then their, their, their FPOS facilities are down and they'll only take cash. And another little handy hint is um, take some $2 and $1 coins. This just makes it easier when you rock into say Punson Bay and you wanna do a load at the washing machine, uh, get your clothes all washed. Alcohol restrictions, you might be reading about there are alcohol restrictions and there are, so, and you need to be aware of it. So no real issue with a few cold beers in the fridge, but be mindful of it um, because there are some areas up on the Cape that do have those total bans, no alcohol in some regions and communities or, or a limited number of alcohol that you can actually take. So just be aware of it and do some further research on that one. Okay, if I was to sum up the OTT, should you do it? Yes. Is it easy? No. So four wheel drive experience, do you need four wheel drive experience to do the Overland Telegraph track? And my answer to that would be definitely yes. I think that um, having some previous experience doing some technical four wheel driving is going to help you do the OTT. There are lots of creek crossings, some have got soft sand, some have got hard sand, some have got rocky bottoms. You've got a lot of uh, steep descents into a lot of these creek crossings and a lot of the track too, there's a lot of off camber and wombat holes and these sorts of things. So I think you do need a little bit of experience negotiating and picking those right lines. Radio. So now I'm gonna talk about the creek crossings. I'm gonna run through them all very quickly for you. So if you're planning a trip to the Cape, this will give you an idea of what to expect, how many creeks you're gonna cross, what are they like, do they have a soft bottom, a hard bottom, are they rocky, have they got holes, have they got a steep entry, a steep exit, do you need to winch and all those sorts of things. So let's get straight into all the creek crossings. Crossing number one, Palm Creek, only about a couple of k's after leaving Bramwell Junction and it's one of the toughest uh, at the moment. A very, very, very steep drop in. This is the main drop in here at Palm Creek. Very steep, almost as steep as uh, the infamous gunshot. Creek wasn't so deep, reasonably firm bottom. The far right one uh, was the easiest option for us. You can see it was still relatively steep for us coming in. We had to traverse up the creek somewhat and uh, this exit coming out of Palm Creek somewhat gnarly and again this is the chicken track and we actually had to winch it was the only place we had to winch uh, on the ott was here at palm creek so palm creek fairly challenging creek and crossing in and out for creek number one number two is dulcy creek i think it is dulcy or juicy creek uh, this one's really simple it's not too deep it's a firm bottom um, you drop in a little bit of a dog leg to the right and then you pop out fairly straightforward and it's a beautiful freshwater creek. Crossing number three and four, you're gonna come across South Alice and North Alice Creek. Now, when we first came across South Alice, I didn't actually know what it was. I thought it was just a, a, a mud or a bog hole. But look, as you can see here, we actually came down on this left-hand side of the creek. The reason why we did not drop in that main channel, so to speak, is because we had heard quite a few vehicles had been getting stuck right as they dropped in and we're having to get 
pulled back out or winched out. So this was a little challenging for us and I'm sure it, um, it varies from season to season. We only had barely enough room to, to get on this left-hand bank here at South Alice Creek. And as you can see there, look how close that mirror comes to the tree. And then if we look to the other side, Mick was driving, we're only about, I don't know, 30 centimeters, 20, 30 centimeters from falling in. So South Alice Creek changes from year to year, fairly straightforward, but be careful on that one. Go to North Alice, which is the next one, fairly straightforward uh, North Alice Creek, although a bit of a drop in, and I scraped the rear end of the car, dropping in, but otherwise pretty easy at North Alice. Creek crossing is dull hunty. I wish we had to spend a bit more time here. This was a beautiful creek. I don't have a lot of footage of this one, but uh, look, it's a rocky bottom, very simple. Come in, dog leg to the right, bit of a sandy exit, but no problem at all. Dull hunty, beautiful creek and very easy to cross. Brings you to Birdie Creek. Birdie Creek is uh, beautiful. That's where we camped on Birdie Creek. But this is the one that you might have seen on YouTube or TV before. It's the one where you've got to come into the creek there and do a right. You've got to travel up about 40 or 50 metres, then cross over, and you've got to keep an eye out for the large holes that are in the rock. So firm bottom, rock bottom, but um, just be careful of the line that you pick coming across. Maybe, ha maybe have a couple of spotters um, to make sure that you don't fall into any of those holes. When you come out of Birdie Creek, there are a couple of exit options. We took probably one of the, um, wasn't the easiest one out, wasn't the hardest one out, and uh, but once again came out quite easy. Birdie Creek, beautiful creek, and a lot of people do camp on Birdie Creek as well. So, nice one, that one. Next one along is Clamot. Clamotti Creek, I can't quite pronounce that one. I didn't know the name of it at the time. It's a big kind of horseshoe, dog leg to the right. Um, it's a sandy bottom, this one. It's not super soft sand, and for us, it wasn't too deep from, from memory, but um, a fairly straightforward uh, horseshoe one and nothing to be too concerned about. All right, Gunshot Creek, guys. So just before you get to Gunshot Creek, if you do not want to do it because it is steep, um, no matter what drop in you go, you can do uh, the bypass road and go all the way around and come back in on the other side if you wish. But Gunshot Creek, there's about five or six different drop-ins. And obviously the main gunshot, the infamous one, is the most steepest. It's almost vertical, very similar to Palm Creek this season. And I'm sure it changes from season to season. However, when you rock up to Gunshot, again, don't rush it. Park your car up, go out, assess it, have a look at all the, all the drop-ins and work out which one that you want to do. You may want to do May Gunshot, that might be your thing. For me, I didn't want to damage my 200 series Land Cruiser. We were looking for the easiest path into Gunshot Creek. So we did the far right track. So you won't be able to miss it if you're there doing, doing Cape York or doing the OTT, you won't miss it. Go to the far right and, at, uh, and from what I understand, that's by and large usually the easiest drop-in. Um, but as you can see here, still for us, it was a little bit of a challenge. Mick there behind the wheel, and look, the GoPro don't do it. The GoPros don't do it justice, just how steep uh, and kind of gnarly it actually is there at gunshot. Mick dropped it in, reasonable, reasonable amount of water there at one stage, water flowing over the, uh, the bonnet, and then the exit out of gunshot creek is somewhat gnarly. So be prepared for that. Again, it probably does change over the years, but I think from watching lots of YouTube videos, it's still reasonably gnarly each year. So that exit out of gunshot, be prepared for that. When you do gunshot, don't rush up and do the exit. Maybe pull up, assess the exit. There's a couple of little lines you can do and then uh, negotiate your way up gunshot. Um, after that one, you come to Cockatoo Creek. This was one of my favorite uh, creeks and a beautiful spot if you want to camp cockatoo creek i can't recommend that enough we uh, this is the one where we pulled up and had lunch we pulled the car up and uh, we had lunch right on the creek it was bloody beautiful this is an example of where i was saying before if you had a bit more time we come across a young couple here i think they had their dog with them i think they were camped up there for about five days here at cockatoo creek and i can understand why beautiful creek lots of little deep water holes grab a beer enjoy the day however the creek itself it's a rocky bottom, Cockatoo Creek, but there are lots of holes and rocks. So you do need to be cautious coming through Cockatoo Creek. Go and walk it first, 
or do what we did when we got there, there was a young fellow there and I asked him, where's everyone going? Which way are they going? And he said, basically, people are going up through this way and hooking left or go this way and hook right. And that's, you know, we went and walked it and had a look. And I think that's the key with all these crossings, guys. Walk them, assess it, and don't rush. After Cockatoo Creek, we come to what's called Sheldon, Sheldon Lagoon. And at the time, I didn't know, it, you know, it's not a creek, and I didn't know what it was, if it had a name. But again, uh, very important to walk these crossings. As you can see here, I go out, I have a bit of a walk and you can see I fall into a big wheel rut. So it was quite deep on that left hand side. Changes obviously from season to season. I know I keep saying that, but pretty much straightforward. We just stuck to the right and went through that uh, Sheldon Lagoon pretty easy. Next one here is Sailor Creek. Pretty straightforward, a fairly solid base, not a lot of water in it. Once you come out of Sailor Creek, you then get a pop out and you're finished the southern section of the Overland Telegraph track. So you'll come out and you'll intercept the Bamiga Road or the Bypass Road. Then you'll drive on that road about five or seven kilometers. Then you'll start the northern section of the old Telegraph track. That northern section, well, wow, what a way to start the OTT on that northern section. So you've got Fruit Bat Falls, Elliot and Twin Falls. So these are accessible for a lot of people that have got caravans that leave their caravan just on the, the bypass Bamiga Road and then head in and uh, visit these two beautiful bloody waterfalls. They are absolutely gorgeous. Um, um, my favourite was uh, was Elliot Falls. So the first one is, is Fruit Bat. That's that really wide waterfall and uh, it is absolutely beautiful. The water's warm. There are lots of little holes you can sit in. It is just absolutely gorgeous up there in the middle of the OTT. A little further along, you've got Elliot and Twin Falls. So these are two waterfalls located in the same area. Both are beautiful, but my pick of all the waterfalls that we saw on the OTT was Elliot Falls. And I think because of just the, the nature, it's kind of got a beautiful little horseshoe environment. It's kind of, uh, you know, in the bush. It's just, I don't know, it was just beautiful. You could jump in, the water was just bloody beautiful. And again, all the people that you meet at these spots, these creek crossings, and also at these waterfalls, you're having great conversations with these people and you're gonna bloody love it. Fruit Bat Falls, Elliot Falls, and Twin Falls, what a way to start the northern section of the track. Straight after the uh, Twin Falls and Elliott Falls, you're gonna to come to Canal Creek. There's a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, crossing options here. We did arrive at probably what was the easiest one. It was a rocky bottom, but it had a couple of those big massive holes and I was concerned I was gonna bottom out the car. So we went to the left line uh, at uh, Canal Creek and um, it, was, uh, it wasn't uh, super challenging, but we did have to think twice because uh, there were a couple of sort of deep sections, a few rocks and a very narrow exit, uh, as you can see there, guys. So, and then further coming out of Canal Creek, a little undulating, but pretty much straightforward. But Canal Creek, another great place to camp. Got Sand Creek here, guys. This was uh, pretty straightforward. A lot of people camped here. In fact, this was the busiest spot that we saw campers on and we were going to camp here but because there were so many people camping here there were still plenty of camps however we chose not to camp because it was it was quite busy but um and we didn't get a lot of footage of actually some of the other areas of sam creek but dropping into sam creek again a couple of little options relatively easy a firm bottom no dramas in and out wish we had to spend a bit more time and and explored some of those other areas of sam creek because uh, I do know that there are some deeper water holes that we didn't actually get to see that were just off the, uh, the area where you drive through. This is coming down into Mistake Creek. This was really gnarly and this was towards the end of our uh, second day here on the track. And uh, the only line you can do here at the moment is the far right hand line. A couple of these left hand lines are all washed away from, from big wet season. And uh, this, was, uh, this was first gear low range, Mick coming down here, again on the GoPro, doesn't really illustrate how steep and kind of off camber it was. But I can tell you that this one was, was reasonably challenging, dropping into the creek, not too deep, um, less than sort of waist deep, sand wasn't that soft, reasonably firm sand, and a bit of a horseshoe right, 
and up and out of Mistake Creek. Coming out of Mistake Creek, um, again, not too challenging, but you know, a little bit of experience needed to pick your line, some big wombat holes, bit of wheel lift here and there, coming out of Mistake Creek. This one here is Cannibal Creek. There's a couple of lines in the Cannibal. We've gone on the far right line, and the far left line was a little bit too steep and gnarly for us. And obviously dropping in, got to be very careful. As you can see there, the car almost thought about rolling. Probably, probably wasn't going to roll, but at the time when I was there uh, watching Mick come down, it looked like it was going to possibly roll. So take that one nice and easy and come in. This one here was reasonably deep. As you can see there, there's a bit of water there. However, the, the bottom, I, won't, I wouldn't say it was firm sand. It was certainly not super soft, but probably in between. And coming out of Canal Creek was also uh, somewhat challenging. Only one way to get out, a very narrow exit, and uh, it's an area where you have to be mindful um, that you're not gonna roll over and hit that embankment. And as you can see there, we've got a wheel coming up off the ground and um, yeah, the 200 series really came into its own there with the traction control and uh, we got out of there uh, without any, you know, needing to get winched out. So come to Cypress Creek. So the only, uh, I guess the only creek that's got a bridge and it just blows my mind that uh, I'm not sure who builds this bridge each year. I think it's a group of people up there at the Cape but it blows my mind. I think it gets washed away almost every season and they go back, rebuild this bridge and use the ratchet straps and uh, and then, you know, a thousand or two thousand or thousands of cars go across it each season. But um, look, fairly straightforward, a little nerve wracking. I drove this one myself and I think it's pretty handy to have a spotter there just to let you know, take it easy. And, uh, but be aware that, you know, people have had accidents there in the past don't rush this one, uh, enjoy it, take it slow. And even when I was on Cypress uh, Bridge here, a couple of logs had sort of dislodged and moved and I did feel the car move. Once you come out of uh, Cypress Creek Bridge there, it's straightforward and you continue along the OTT. Second to last crossing is Logan's guys. It's a long crossing and it is deep. There are a couple of entry points into this uh, creek. My advice is to do the one on the left, which is the longest one. You can go a little further to the right. It is shorter, but apparently the, it's got a very muddy bottom and people do get bogged there trying to uh, get away with doing a shorter crossing. The crossing itself is pretty firm. It's pretty firm bottom, firm sand. It's a sandy bottom. It is long. And as you can see there, probably one of the deepest crossings of the old uh, Telegraph track. Mix driving along there, the car is actually bouncing up and down a little bit in the water, hitting the bottom and then bobbing back up. Now, uh, we did get a little bit of water egress in the car, uh, as you can see there, but very minimal. We weren't there for, we weren't in the creek that long. Um, so pretty straightforward, but again, certainly walk that one as well. That brings us to the final water crossing of the OTT, and that's the infamous Nolans Brook. And I'm sure you've all heard about it, you've all seen lots of YouTube videos on it, and this is where uh, it swallows up a lot of cars every season. So a lot of people do get stuck in the soft sand here at Nolans Brook. So that's one thing that I will say. Be very prepared when you're doing Nolans, and have a recovery plan in place. Now, when we got there, there was no one on the other side of Nolan. So what we chose to do was to organize a recovery setup. So I went across the other side, I set up a recovery setup. We got the winch all wound out. So if we got stuck in that soft sand in the deep part, I did not want the 200 sitting there for five or 10 minutes. We will get water inside the car. Luckily enough, we took it slow. My advice here is drop those air pressures even further. So tire pressures, we were running at around 22. We dropped down to about 15 or so uh, to go through uh, Nolans, which is gonna help in that soft sand. Well, that's a wrap, guys. The Overland Telegraph Track, the OTT. We did it in 2022. Make sure you get yourself up there. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you got something out of it, really appreciate. If you give us a big thumbs up, it helps our channel grow. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our channel if you are into camping, four-wheel driving, and touring, and all that sort of great stuff. So anyway, until next time, 
get yourself out there and we'll see you in the next one. Cheers guys. Bye.